Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jacob Shizmanik. He is a professor of log logic, language, and computation at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Jacob, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. So Jacob, could you give a brief overview of your research and then we can talk about your background. We can talk about uh, some more specific details later. Yeah, so I've been doing quite a few different things in my life as a researcher, but I would say that they all revolve around uh, using computational or maybe more specifically logical means to describe language and cognition. And if I would uh, need to give you maybe like one sentence or one domain that I'm specifically interested, I think I would say that I'm very much interested in complexity and how it relates to, well, both computer science, like in theoretical computer science, computational complexity, or maybe computability in general, but also how it relates to cognitive science, like how can you describe cognitive difficulty uh, using mathematical means, both using computational models, but also learning experiments. Can you, for instance, take some measure of complexity and then based on that measure, predict something and then go to a lab, study human behavior and see the effects of that measure. So I think that's that's what my research was really revolving around for, mm -hmm. for many years now. Yeah, it seems like some pretty interdisciplinary work. And I'm wondering which direction you were pulled by, because on one hand, if you started out interesting in, interested in linguistics, you might think that you're doing more behavioral work traditionally, like with, with human subjects. And on the other hand, most people interested in just computer science might be doing something, um, I don't know, le less specific than focusing on, on language. So how did you come to combine those two? So like, uh, historically speaking, or like looking into my biography, I started studying in something that was called interdisciplinary individual studies in humanities. And then I started with philosophy. Uh, so back in high school, I was very much interested in the philosophy of language. I took part in something called philosophical Olympiad. Uh, we have such things in Europe. And then I developed this interest in philosophy of language and philosophy of logic and maybe philosophy of science. And for a brief moment, I was considering actually to study mathematics because then back then I learned about logic, but I finally ended up in the philosophy department. Uh, but within this context of interdisciplinary studies, so we could choose and build our own program with tutors. And I think very quickly I started studying logic. Like, in fact, I found a logic group in Warsaw. Uh, as you may know, Warsaw has a very long logic tradition in the 20th century. So there was a strong group of logicians. And they were thinking a lot back then about uh, concepts like mathematical concepts and the computational complexity. And that also sort of triggered my interest towards applying those notions in both psychology and linguistics. Mm -hmm. So I studied a bit of linguistics uh, during the studies. I also started in the third year, I basically took a BA in math because that was, well, sort of strong advice. If you want to be a logician, then you need to study mathematics. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere at the very, very end of my studies, I started doing courses in psychology because back then I was really thinking like we have the notion of computational complexity. How does that relate to, well, all that work in psychology that is trying to, to mm -hmm. capture human mind. So does it have anything to do with this? Or it's a completely different notion. So, so that's how I, um, how I sort of got in cognitive science. And then I left to do my PhD in Amsterdam, uh, which ended up to be uh, very much in like mathematical modeling of natural language. So it was following the same line. So I was particularly focusing on quantifiers. So expressions like all, some, most, almost all. So we have plenty of those expressions in natural language. And I still like, probably like, I don't know, around 80% of my time, I'm somehow dealing with quantifiers. And then I was studying the, what is called computational complexity. So I was trying to understand how much computational resources, like theoretical models of computations need to, for instance, decide whether a sentence, most of the dots are blue is true or false in a given situation, what we call 
models, like mathematical models, like. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I've been doing. And only the last chapter of my dissertation was trying to, to take some of those measures of computational complexity and uh, run experiments with subjects and see whether, well, whether the action times and accuracy fall in line with, uh, with those theoretical predictions. What so that was to do that. Well, I mean, that's uh, what I said at the very beginning. I, uh, I think it was curiosity of how those mathematical, very general mathematical notions uh, correspond to, um, to more psychological notions, right? So if you, if you think about mind in these computational terms, then I think it's a very natural step, right? So we, we try to think about computations in terms of, let's say, different measures of complexity. Does the human mind actually obey the same limits? Mm -hmm. Right? So in, in some sense, you can think like it's like if you think about church Turing thesis, right, which is basically trying to say, I mean, like in the psychological version, right, saying that human mind is somehow equivalent to a computational device. So you may want to go one step further and ask, okay, so if a human mind is a computational device and we, for instance, make distinction between what's tractable and what's intractable in computer science, right, so we roughly divide computational problems into those that we can compute. I mean, the computers can compute and computers will never be able to compute. So are those notions actually useful to describe human mind? So I think that's the very basic initial motivations for doing that type of research. Yeah, I agree with that. The, the reason I ask is because I had another, I had a, a philosophy professor from USC uh, on recently, and he specializes in logic and philosophy of mathematics, but then for him, it seems it seems like much more of this abstract thing where you're doing formal proofs and it's 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 much less applied. So that so it seems like that's one direction you could go, and then the other direction you could go is is very applied and, and as you mentioned, uh, as it relates to the human mind. Yes. Also, if you think about logic, then I think you can in general think about two basic research streams or basic takes on what logic is. And one is very much this proof theoretic spirit, right? Where you build formal proof systems and you are really focused on the notion of inter inference, the notion of derivation. Mm -hmm. And that's actually like, like an important tool in AI. And there's this other way of thinking about logic that I myself very much subscribe to, which is thinking about logic in terms of what's called model theoretic ways. So thinking about those logical concepts as for instance, sets of some abstract objects. And then, I mean, then if you, if you take this route, uh, then maybe it's a bit, um, maybe it gives you a bit different take on cognition, right? Because then you can think about con also like concepts that human use, like a concept of a number or a concept of majority or a concept of, uh, I don't know, the concepts like all or some. And then you start wondering, are those concepts as we humans have them actually similar to those concepts as we describe them in mathematics? Do they have similar properties? If they have similar properties, uh, what does that mean? How can we like explore those mathematical descriptions of those concepts? So I think that this model, I mean, for me, this is this model theoretic take on that. So sometimes people, sometimes linguists actually object to my work by thinking that it's some of it might be more about concepts than about languages because I'm really interested in semantics, right? So I'm really interested in meaning. So what is the meaning attached to different words or constructions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you mentioned you mentioned in your dissertation, you you looked for overlap between, I guess, what, what your models were showing and what human subjects were actually doing, right? And you sent me some papers uh, when we were scheduling this call, which I'll link in the description, but it, I was wondering, reading those, how do we know that a neural network learning something is actually learning something in the same way that a human does? Because it seems like, I mean, CAPTCHAs are a good example, because there are some things where it's like, it's easy for a human to just look at and know, and it's hard for a computer to do. But there are other things like, you know, adding up or multiplying huge numbers that a human couldn't do, but a computer can do in a fraction of a second. So I'm wondering how, how we we know whether it's it's something that's that's comparable 
Yeah, so there may be two things to, uh, to say about your question. Right, so these papers that you've seen, there are much less, I mean, maybe they are related in some spirit to, to my work uh, uh, during my PhD times, but they, they are also a bit of a new, new line of work. But I think there are like two things you can think about. So one thing, if you are studying complexity of let's say concepts, or you can think about like, what is sort of the minimal complexity? What is the smartest way to compute something? For instance, what is the smartest way to compute majority, right? And then whatever humans do, they shouldn't be able to break that limit. So they may not use optimal algorithms, they may not use optimal strategies, but well, uh, they won't, I mean, they won't find that like, if, if there's a logical theorem telling you this is the easiest way, they're like, there's no simpler way to do that, then, then we sort of assume that humans won't, uh, won't go below that, right? That humans obey logical laws or computational laws or algorithmic laws. So I think this notion of minimal complexity often is very interesting because then you may go to the lab and see how much actually human agents diverge from this optimal behavior, right? And this is not that surprising, right? So if you think about computational modeling, we really, I mean, almost every computational model assumes some very high standard of rationality, either in like let's say Bayesian terms that we have rational Bayesian agents or in logical terms that we follow logical validity or in sort of whatever mathematical framework uh, framework you use, there's always some very strong notion of rationality. So I think that's, um, that's how it connects. And then when you talk about neural networks and, and our current work, then I think the idea in that paper was to show that certain cognitive explanation might be a plausible story about human learning. And there we just use neural networks to, to show like, look, there is a computational model, computational model of learning for which this story makes sense. So if humans are in any way similar to these neural networks, or at least like human learning is in any way or in a relevant way comparable to how neural networks learn, then the same story might be plausible for humans. Mm -hmm. So this is well, like just trying to yeah, like just trying to say that our story is plausible. We are not saying that our story is right, right? We are just trying to right. show that's plausible. Uh huh. And what are the some of the ways that we diverge from these optimal solutions? Because it it seems like there's a, there's a trade off between I guess like maybe the, the the computational power necessary to to compute some optimal solution versus evolutionary speaking our brain is probably going to do the bare minimum it can that works and nothing more like it wouldn't waste any, any other resources right yes so i mean so for instance if we so if we go back to to the neural network paper so basically the problem which we consider in this neural network paper is the following so we know that there are very strong universal properties across languages. So in that particular way, in that particular paper, we know that, I mean, there are two case studies in that paper. So one is color categorizations. So we know that color categories across languages have some geometrical properties. And the other properties, we know that all quantifiers across languages have some properties, mathematical properties. And the question is why? Right? And there are many ways to explain that. So you may try to explain that uh, via an evolutionary story. You might try to explain it. Uh, it might be either biological evolution or cultural evolution. And actually what we are doing in this paper, we're trying to say that you can explain that by looking at the inherent complexity of those concepts that are lexicalized in languages. And basically what we are saying, like if those concepts are easier in a sense that they are easier to learn for neural networks and neural networks, they just give us a measure of complexity, then they are more likely to be lexicalized across different languages. But if you think about that, then our story is really in terms of what we like to call a heat map. So if you imagine all possible concepts, 
then some of them are really hot. And those are the ones that are very likely to be lexicalized. And some of them are maybe cool colors. Uh, they're not so hot regions of the space. They're less likely to be lexicalized by a language, but complexity, those mathematical properties are not everything. So for instance, some of them might be very useful for communication, and then they will finally get lexicalized, right? So you may think that there's a trade-off between what languages want to do. They, on the one hand, they want to reduce complexity because they want to be as easy to learn as possible, as easy to acquire as possible. But on the other hand, languages want to be as expressive as possible. Mm -hmm. So this is that other pressure that might be pulling in the very different direction. Actually, like you want to be more informative, more expressive, then add more concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot add too much because then, then you become uh, hard to learn. So, uh -huh. so that's yeah. the balance that languages try to strive for. Do you know of any work showing that if you if you kind of constrain the limits of your model, does that does the language that it would produce more resemble that of children? So like more limited cognitive capacity, so you'd only have this this simpler form of language. Yeah, so there's uh, a much work uh, showing this trade-off for different linguistic domains. So for instance, like I think the first paper that initiated that uh, was the paper about kinship terms. So what the researchers did, they generated artificial kinship terms and then they measured the complexity and they measured the informativeness. And then they, so right, so you get a grid uh, of artificial uh, kinship terms and some of them are in this, what they call Pareto border. So they really, like give you almost optimal trade-off between uh, complexity and informativeness. So you cannot, you know, you cannot decrease complexity by at the same time, I mean, decrease, like decrease simplicity without losing some informativeness. So you are really like on this optimal trade-off. And then when they had this, they looked uh, in the kinship terms of natural languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that they're also lying on this Pareto border. So, I mean, there's just one domain where you see that, oh, indeed, it might be that natural languages are optimizing this trade-off between complexity and informativeness. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any specific work that look into children, into children language. So, I mean, it's a very good question. So it would be interesting to see whether there's some sort of transition happening uh, why the language develops uh -huh. uh, in children, but I don't. I actually don't know any papers about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another question I have is is the idea that we're we're generally using the same maybe few hundred most common words, even in a language with like tens of thousands of words. So so it seems like most of our vocabulary are are these fringe terms that aren't used as much and that are harder to learn. So mm -hmm. how, how does that come into to language learning from a computational perspective? Right, so I think like a very classical idea is this idea that zip put forward. Right, this is exactly what you are saying that this, the simplest term in some sense are used most often. And then the usability of terms, it really falls down exponentially while the terms are becoming more and more complex. Yeah, and often we have so many words to describe the same thing. So it seems yeah. like from an Again, if, the, if this evolved to be like as simple as possible or as easy to learn as possible, I don't see why that, that would have happened. But I think it's like, because I mean, using, I don't know, 1000 most common words, you can probably communicate majority of the ideas and that's why they uh, become very common. But then of course that is like this whole tale of words, which is used much less, but it might be still very useful in some, I mean, let's call it niche communication, right? So if you want to talk about some specific scientific domain or, or maybe even not a scientific domain, I don't know if you are renovating old furniture, then you probably need some specific words. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are just domains where those words turn out to be, uh, to be useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this kind of hits on one of our philosophical questions. It's the idea of like, how much does language determine how you think? And 
you know, it, it does it does seem pretty powerful to to think that because there are certain thoughts that you might not have if you don't have the language to express it. But on the other hand, it seems like what what we just got out there is saying that a thought if a thought exists and there's no word for it, then a word will be created for it. It seems like that's what was hinted at there. Yeah, yeah. So that, of course, goes back to this very old debate of uh, universalism versus relativism, right? So how much language is actually shaping, uh, uh, shaping our thinking. Uh, and I think it's still a relatively hot debate in cognitive science, but it seems that, uh, uh, that the truth lies somewhere in between, right? So right now we know that to a certain extent, language shapes or influence our perception. So one a very famous example that you also mentioned in the email to me is this so-called categorical perception, right? So if, you, if I ask you to distinguish two shades um, of different colors, then you will be faster uh, telling them apart if they have different labels in your language, mm -hmm. right? So if, for instance, if we speak different languages and my language gives the same label to those two different colors and your language gives different labels, then you will be probably faster to react. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that shows that there is some influence of, of language, the language we speak on, on our perception. So that would be an argument for, for relativism. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, what I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, and, and you also mentioned it now asking your questions, that it seems that there are some universal properties across cultures. So at the end, all cultures are able to distinguish between different colors. Uh, and are able to communicate in one way or another differences between those colors. Um, there are also some universal properties, like I mentioned, universal geometrical properties of color categorization that seems to be independent from, from any language. So that would be an argument for this sort of universalism that, that, that language doesn't matter that much. So I think it's somewhere in between that language is probably modulating our perception uh, but there are many, many things about the way we perceive the world that are really independent from, from languages that we speak. Yeah, almost any time there seems to be this big either or debate in, uh, of a hot topic in science, like nature versus nurture is another good example. The, the answer yeah. is something like, it's a lot of both. Well, the answer is it's, it's very complicated probably, right? That's, <laughs> yeah. That's also the answer. So another mm -hmm. example related to this color perception thing it's, well, I, I, I think I remember reading, well, there are some, there are some uh, languages where there's only like a handful of primary colors, like less than we have in English, for example. So people might look at, I don't know, blue and green and see them as different shades of the same color. And then on the other hand, um, I remember reading that Eskimos might have like 50 different words for different shades of like white or very, very light blue because in, in that environment, when, when everything's icy, it's it's more valuable to be able to tell those colors apart. So I, I'm not uh, in any way an expert on color terms, but as far as I know, the Eskimo mm. part is just an urban legend. Oh, really? <laughs> so that, that doesn't seem to, to check out if, if you look more carefully into, into those Eskimo languages. Oh, yeah, that's good to know. <laughs> uh, uh, but indeed, I think what is true is that they have there are cultures and languages that have different numbers of primary colors. Uh, but I think what's very interesting about that and what seems again to be a universal property of languages that we can predict what those colors roughly going to be if we know how many of those the culture have. So going back to the 60s, Berlin and K, they looked into different languages across cultures. And it seems that, well, if a culture has two Two colors, then it's probably something like warm and cold or light and dark, so like black and white. If there's a third color, that will be probably red. And then if there's like a fourth color, I, I don't remember, it, I think it's either yellow or blue. So there's like a systematic hierarchy mm -hmm. of like adding more colors. And of course, that also like triggered lots of research because people were wondering, Okay, how can you explain that, mm -hmm. that hierarchy? Why people always act like the third color? And again, I think 
you can have uh, explanations that are more focused on the environment, right? So you may say there's like, for instance, those colors that are added are in some sense like focal colors. So it's like a property of colors that they, that they are just the most like obvious to add to your language. That might be a property of your environment that, I mean, like all those differences can be explained by the intensity of different colors in different environments. And indeed there are some papers that, that actually look at that and see that there are differences between color names in the Northern, Southern hemisphere. So this is pretty, this is pretty interesting. So, I mean, like all those different explanations, but it seems that, you know, they are, they are always telling us an partial story of uh, mm -hmm. why we have the colors we have. Is there a similar pattern with your work on, on quantifiers? Cause, cause I would imagine like, if you could only have two, then maybe you'd have something like all or none or most and least, but then the, 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 the more dimensions you add, I guess, the more nuance you can, you can bring into. No, so that doesn't seem that there's like this type of hierarchy. Uh, there are differences between languages in, uh, I guess, how many quantifiers they have. But it's also, I think it's much harder to say than in case of color terms, right? Because if you want to study color terms, you can come up with these color chips. You can go and ask people to name different color chips. And then you will get a repertoire of primary colors of a language. It's much harder with quantifiers because of course that linguistic debates, what is precisely a quantifier? I mean, how do you learn that certain expression is a quantifier? So that's a bit harder. We, we don't have this very good corpora uh, with tact quantifiers like cross linguistic corpora. But nevertheless, we know quite a lot. So we, we for instance, know, oh, we know that there is no language that lexicalize not all. Right, so almost all languages have concepts like all, like monomorphemic yeah, concept. There's like turning it into a single word, into a single word. <laughs> but it seems that not all is not that dominant. Many languages have most, uh, but it seems that there are very few languages that put the concept of less than half, or maybe there's no language that that takes less than half and makes it into a single concept. And we can express that. Uh -huh. Um, and you can actually find mathematical properties of these number words and that sort of delimit uh, the linguistic categories. So one way of thinking about it is like, you can imagine all logically possible sort of quantifier words. So basically what they are, they, they talk about the number of elements satisfying different predicates and they sort of compare. So like most A's are B, is basically telling you that the number of A's that are B is greater than the number of A's that are not B, right? Some A's are B basically means well that the number of A's that are B is like at least one or maybe more than two. I mean, depending whether there's a plural or singular at the end and so on and so forth, right? An even number of, which is like a strange construct tells you that there's like, well, an even number of objects that are both A and B. And then you can, think, okay, but logically speaking, there are many, many possible quantifiers. You could say, for instance, something like the number of A's is equal to the number of B's, but it seems there's no language uh, that actually has a quantifier that, 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 that gets exactly that meaning. And then people like in the eighties, when they took this mathematical theory of quantification, they started like using it to describe natural languages, people like Bauweiss and Cooper, then they very uh, quickly ask that question. So what are those properties that delimit logical repertoire of quantifiers to those like basic quantifier concepts that are actually realized in natural languages? Mm -hmm. And there are like a few of those properties. So like, I don't know, like a very famous property is conservativity. And this is like in almost in like in every language of the world, we don't know really counter examples, but there's one uh, is if I say something like Q A sub B, so for instance, like most A sub B, then has the following properties that, I, that I'm really only talking about A elements and 
A elements that are B, I don't really care about A elements that are not B. And you can see it first if you say something like this in English. If I tell you that most dogs bark, then it's equivalent to saying that most dogs are dogs that bark. Yeah. Like, and, and the same for every other quantifier in English and also in every other language. And yeah, and people, people are really, it seems like to be a good description of the empirical reality, but we, I mean, what we are working on right now is to really understand what are the reasons for that, why languages are shaped or are biased towards that property. Mm -hmm. Because logically speaking, there's like really nothing special about those quantifiers. Right. And then there's also the idea of these things like, let's say more than half that, or, well, I guess that would be most. So less than half you mentioned. Uh, well, any, if that can still be communicated with multiple words, then what, what lexicalize the other, the other terms? Is that the, ma the main question? Yeah, I think the main question is why certain terms uh, get lexicalized, mm -hmm. uh, why others don't. And of course, I mean, we can talk about very complex concepts. I mean, this whole notion of natural language is a bit vague, right? I mean, I mean, I don't know if um, if we go and study set theory, we we talk about infinitely many elements or countably many elements, and we all talk about very complex concepts, and we all understand them. I mean, it takes some schooling, but you can understand them. Uh, so yeah, we can express them, but. Uh, but we basically do it in a combinatorial way, right? So we express these complex concepts by sort of combining those atomic, those simple concepts. Uh huh. Yeah, and and like you, you also see when people when people stray from these rules of language, they tend to do it in the same way, or or sometimes in ways that make it easier. So texting is a great example of that because if I want to communicate something like. Um, why didn't you do this? I could write that out as like a whole sentence, or I could say the letter Y, the letter U, no, question mark. And it, it, it kind of communicates the same thing, even though it's like so, so grammatically wrong. So I think that's another, like, I think it's a great example for really trying to reach that balance uh, between, on the one hand, you want to send as short message as possible, maybe because you're lazy, <laughs> maybe because you think this is the efficient way to communicate, but you cannot make it too short because then you know that the receiver won't understand that, right? So that's again, it's like trying to, I think there's lots of those trade-offs in the language between simplicity and whatever are the other communicative goals you want to, you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so do you think there's an evolution towards language becoming simpler in that way? Like a lot of people, again, in texting, they won't type out the word you, they'll, they'll say the letter you and everyone understands what it means. So does that mean we're moving towards something like, why do we need the longer word at all? Or is it just that that's what I'm, I'm struggling to understand because if it, it's obviously a shorthand that works, but then it, it seems like if it, if it works enough, then it would take over the, the, the old word or the real longer term. Yes, yeah, so I think if you look into um, evolutionary models of, of language, so for instance, one model that we looked at in our research is so-called iterated learning. So you basically have agents teaching next generation of agents about the language, and then the next generation is teaching another generation. And of course, in that process, you lose some information because I mean, those agents are maybe not perfect. Maybe they don't get access to like in big enough sample of the language to be learned. So, I mean, you see, you can, for instance, start with, with a random language, let's say, and then pass it through the iteration of the agents. And you, you may wonder what's gonna emerge at the end. And basically often what emerges are like, I don't want to say simpler versions, uh, but in some sense, more regularized version. So for instance, we did this uh, for uh, for those quantifier properties. So we sort of, one property is so-called monotonicity. So if I tell you, uh, if I tell you that, um, for instance, uh, some, some children are muddy, then you know that from that it follows that uh, 
some children are dirty, mm -hmm. right? Because some has that property, it's called upward monotonicity that I can go from, from the muddy and I can substitute it with a more general term. Mm -hmm. And if I, and for some quantifiers it work other ways around. So if I tell you that no children is uh, muddy, then you also know, uh, if, it, if I tell you that no children is dirty, then you also know that no children is specifically muddy. Mm -hmm has mud on the forehead or whatever, right? So this is like, okay, so that's, there's a property of those terms called monotonicity that makes reasoning very easy. And there are some terms in natural language, like more than five or fewer than three, which don't have this that property, or like an even number of doesn't have this property. You cannot reason uh, either from more specific term to the more general term or vice versa. It just doesn't have those properties. So this is one of these universal constraints uh, on languages. So it seems that all quantifiers lexicalized in any language of the world, they are monotone. And what we actually did, we, we built this model with artificial agents. They were like little neural networks. We start with a random quantifier, which is non monotone because monotonous is again a very rare property. And you give the quantifier the first agent, and then the agent is trying to, okay, understand that quantifier, like learn the language of the quantifier, and then it's teaching like the next agent. And after 300 generation, what we basically see that those agents start speaking monotone languages. So monotonicity emerges from like two things, from the individual bias towards monotonicity. So we know that if you take an individual neural network, it's gonna be easier for that network to learn the meaning of monotone quantified than the meaning of non-monotone quantified. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't explain that doesn't explain why languages have monotone quantifiers, because how do you go from this individual bias, individual mind to sort of linguistic reality? And that's where the evolution comes handy because you can show that those little biases individual biases in this process of iteration, the process of evolution, they may add up to a huge bias towards monotonicity. They will make monotone languages to emerge. And I think that's what you see in many of those experiments. If your agents are biased towards something, like towards simplicity or, or something regular in the vocabulary, then like communication evolution may really strengthen those biases. So at the end, you will get languages that are simpler. Or, I mean, again, what's simplicity or just bias towards uh, something. Uh -huh. I also want to ask you about the tendency to, it seems like we're, we're sort of clumping into these super languages. It's like we have, we have a handful of languages with more than a billion speakers across the world. And then there are like thousands of languages with less than a thousand speakers that are dying out. So it seems like we're sort of converging onto like, well, I guess I guess the ones that are most spoken. Yes, I think that's a set reality, right? That that we are losing many, many languages. Well, yeah, everyone, yeah. everyone presents it as a sad reality. And, and that's always been puzzling to me because it seems, I mean, maybe I'm looking at it from a more detached perspective, but I'm thinking that if people are, if, if people are turning to the ones that are most useful to them, then why is that a bad thing? Yeah, so I mean, okay, so there are two different perspectives, right? So so it's said in the sense that we are not gonna know all those exciting things about many languages. So if you if, if you are a linguist, I mean you you like variety because I mean it tells you something about uh, about language in general. So if there are no languages, you cannot really study them. So in that sense, it seems sad. Um, whether it's a bad thing or a good thing for humanity, it's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to, I don't have like a very strong opinion on that, right? Indeed, it might be that, that what is happening is that we are being biased towards these big languages of industrialized communities and those languages, they get simpler and simpler. So I think there is, for instance, this research like, I mean, you might ask that question. So it seems at least intuitively that some languages are simpler than other languages in the sense that it's maybe a bit easier to learn them if you are like a second uh, language learner, or maybe even it's a bit easier for kids to acquire them. So, so there is this intuition that some languages are easier than other languages. And I think one question you may ask, so is it because some languages 
are spoken by much bigger communities than other languages. Right? So it seems like if many, many people start speaking a language, then this pressure for simplicity is much stronger. And for instance, if the language have many second, uh, mm, I mean, second language learners, then the pressure might be even stronger. I think it might be the case of English that we, I mean, because many people speak English now, mm -hmm. um, maybe this process of simplifying English is, um, is going faster. I guess we will know. Uh, at some point, right? I mean, we, I mean, people study that problem. You can study the problem in a lab, right? So you can like, again, like look at artificial language learning and like modulate the size of the community or the networks or how those people are connected and so on and so forth. And you may see what sort of languages will emerge, are they simpler or not? But in, in general, yes, I think in general, the, I, I mean, it seems that and that there's a pressure towards simplicity. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any chance that one day there will just be like a single universal language? Well, I think, uh, so I think it's not very likely in the near future, but I mean, who knows what's gonna happen in 500 years. Right. Right, I mean, I think of course a lot, it's like that is different forces uh, in linguistics so and cognitive science so I mean there are like there's this bias towards simplicity but there's also culture there's politics there are all these forces that might be going in the opposite direction yeah and there's technology like I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. in 50 years we have we have like the ability to have real-time translation of anything we want, maybe on glasses or like in headphones or whatever. So what that, I mean, that, I don't know what that would do. In a, in a way it might discourage language learning because you wouldn't need to, you, you could just stick with what you know and then still be able to communicate with anyone. Yeah, and, and this technology already works very, very well, right? So I remember I used to work in Sweden and I've never learned Swedish and then from, some years I would be still getting like emails from, from Stockholm University and some whatever like companies I registered with. And I set up my Gmail to like automatically translate them in English. So I think for, for many months, I, even, I actually didn't realize that there were, the emails were actually written in Swedish and I just get like a translation. Uh -huh. Because I didn't pay attention. Of course, if you pay attention, you will very quickly realize that. But if it's some sort of generic information you don't care about, this translation is good enough to give you a sense of what it's about. Mm -hmm. And this is a good tie into the last big thing I want to talk about, which is artificial intelligence. And right now I'm specifically thinking, so we have translation and that, you know, it's, it's computationally difficult, but it, it doesn't really require intelligence. It's sort of like this automatic process. But then there's also... There, there's some AIs that have recently been like learning to write short stories or, or do stuff like that and create something truly novel. And that that's a lot closer to intelligence. So so it's, it's sort of like the famous Turing test. It's like if, if you have a computer that can generate sentences that seem like something a, a, a human would say, is that just, is that a form of intelligence or is that just like still following a very set program? Yes, I think the very crucial question for AI, for, for language models, is whether they can understand whether they have a concept of meaning or they just follow some rules. I mean, they discover some statistical regularities and then they follow this pattern of statistical regularities. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, of course, I mean, it's a, again, a very heated debate. So there are many people studying those language models and, and basically, yeah, I mean, you can ask very simple questions. So you can, for instance, ask a question, do they understand, uh, uh, can they distinguish between singular and plural verbs? And, and the answer is probably yes already. Right? And, and the answer is yes, but the answer is also that it, it becomes harder and harder for them if there's more space between like noun and the verb, right? So if I, I mean, they understand that boy like runs, but if you if you put a comma and add some phrase in between the in between the subject and the verb, 
then the longer the distance, the harder it is for, for some of those language models to, to sort of realize that. So is that the case for humans too? Like maybe if it's a child who's learning to read, it'll be harder the, lo the more spaced it is? Yes, I think that's also like a very interesting question in general to compare what those language models can do with what we can do and how we learn language. And like for me, I think this is the most exciting part of uh, what's happening in AI right now is to really use basically psycholinguistic methods to study neural networks and, and deep learning. And like, you know, you basically try to understand what's happening in this black box mm -hmm. uh, by just using the same methods that, that, we, that we are so, I mean, familiar when it comes to studying human subjects. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's all very similar game. We want to know the way we want to know how people represent meaning. We may want to know how neural networks represent meaning. Yeah. Well, in some sense, the human mind is like a black box too, because on the opposite end of the spectrum, you might have people arguing that our sense of meaning is really just this computational process going on in the mind. Like I've, I learned about statistical learning in infants, and it seems like mm -hmm. that's what, one of the first ways they learn to distinguish when one word ends and, and another word begins is through this statistical pattern. And then if that's the case, it, do, it does beg the question, how different is that from what a computer does? Oh yeah, exactly. So I think it's, I really think it's a very fascinating question. And I mean, statistical learning is a, maybe like an interesting point where you would expect some parallels between humans and, uh, and machines. Um, Maybe logic is the place where you would expect differences. So, I mean, we, I think now, or, or there's some research going on about whether neural networks can learn reasoning and how well they can learn, uh, learn that. And that seems to be a challenge for many of those language models to sort of draw conclusion, draw inference from one sentence to the other sentence. But still, I mean, like, you know, the square the models that are so good, so they are so powerful that I think even that seems to be uh, the like typical story that are getting better and better and uh, and are already beating symbolic models or will be very soon beating symbolic models when it comes to this sort of inference tasks. Yeah. But I think the interesting problem is that how they do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I took a neural networks class and it was it was specifically using this. Um, Liebra in a program called Emergent. And what, what the takeaway from that was, it was supposed to model like learning in the same way that the human brain does. So it's like re reward and error driven. And mm -hmm. it seems like what, what, what the professor communicated there was that most modern neural networks, like the, the very high end ones, aren't necessarily doing any, anything the way the brain does. They're just looking for the most optimal solution. Is that right? Well, so again, I think I'm not an expert here, right? So, I mean, there's like, there are really people that study how different, uh, for instance, training regimes in neural networks compared to different parts of the brain. But my general take is that, that it's true what you are saying, right? That this is the case that these neural networks, I mean, don't really resemble the neural, the new, I mean, the neuron level mechanisms of learning, there might be some similarities, mm -hmm. but they are basically that they are basically very different, or at least it doesn't seem that, uh, that there's a very strong parallel between how the brain works and how neural networks do that. But also, of course, I mean, what are neural networks? You know, we have all, all those architectures and they, they come and go. So I think there's no such thing as a general neural network. Right. Well, from what I understand, it was it was originally inspired by kind of how the brain works, but then I guess at some point in the last couple of decades, people realized that we can do things better. And and I guess there's also the question of how much like brute force comes into play because you can have a supercomputer, a literal supercomputer super that's doing something that the human mind couldn't do or that even a normal computer couldn't do, and it might work, but it 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 also might only work because you have so much computational power. Yeah, and also, I mean, uh, there's a second side of that coin, right? That there are many, many things still where we are much better than neural networks. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, like neural networks need so much data to, 
even learn very simple things, why humans are much better and much faster in, in generalizing. Like sometimes we can learn new things from like, you know, like a single example or like a very few examples why it would mm -hmm. take like thousands of examples for neural networks. So, I mean, I personally think that it, it will be very hard to explain human intelligence only in terms of uh, neural networks. You probably also need to assume that we have some sort of language of thought, some logic of thought, that we have some sort of symbolic representation that, that we can use uh, to, to understand the world and to build new concepts. Uh -huh. yeah, symbolic representation is a good point because I've, I've often wondered, you know, what, what would happen if you, if you took some children and raised them like completely outside of society without a language? It, it seems like whether or not they're going to have language, they're certainly still going to have thoughts. And, and it seems like you're, you're going to start to build these symbols in your mind. Like maybe even if you don't have a word for it, you'd have like an idea of what water is or, or what, what a specific food is. But then it seems like only a natural step to once you have those symbols to, to try and communicate them somehow. Yes, and I think like having those symbols, um, those concepts, those basic atomic concepts, it's also very useful uh, because you can use them across different domains, right? So you may use very same like let's say logical structures or like symbolic structures uh, while learning a language and when uh, solving some other puzzles, right? So lots of our like thinking may somehow go back to some of that symbolic structure. But if you look at like machine learning, they basically, I mean like those models, every time they need to recreate the structure of a problem, right? So I mean, People can be pretty good at chess, speak a language, and uh, no, play badminton, uh, and they do this, like they can do all those things without really like special training. And then if you would like to have like a single neural network that can do all those things, that would be of course very difficult because maybe there's, I mean, I mean that's of course, that's of course a question, right? So is there like a, uh, yeah, I mean, basically we have, seems like we have joint representations for different uh, linguistic and mental domains. Mm -hmm. And that makes us very efficient in learning new things. Right, so, so that brings up the question again is like, is, are, we, are we so much better at learning because the way we do things is fundamentally different or, si or simply our brain is a much more powerful computer and maybe one day other computers will catch up to it. Yeah, that's of course a very good question. So, I mean, my feeling is that that we do something fundamentally different, and this is for the for the reasons I just mentioned, right? So, it doesn't seem to me that what we do is we only generalize from the data. It seems that we have some symbolic representations, whatever they are, that help us to make sense of the data. While lots of those models don't have it right so, but could so they have it? yeah maybe they could have it right but then there would be different models uh -huh. and i think still like a center i mean one of the central questions of cognitive science the way i see it is to actually try to understand what are those uh symbolic representations that we have that makes us such efficient learners mm -hmm. and i think okay maybe once we once we have an idea what they might be then we could I mean, we could use that idea to, to implement them in, in our learning models. Maybe then our learning models will, <laughs> I mean, it would be a test basically, right? Whether we have a good theory of what they are. Mm -hmm. So I wanna close asking you about your next steps for your research, what, what, uh, whether that's ongoing projects or long-term goals, and then what, what the practical implications or philosophical implications of that research would be. Yes, so I mean, I'm involved in, of course, a number of projects, but something that I find maybe the most fascinating is, um, is exactly connected to, to the discussion about underlying language of thought. So, I mean, lots of my work in the last two or three years 
was trying to exploit different notions of complexity to explain why languages are basically the way they are. But uh, very often when, when I'm doing it, my group is doing that, or I look at the papers of other researchers, it feels that this notion of complexity or the notion of simplicity that is, I mean, let's put it that way, a bit ad hoc, right? So we take some sort of measure and we say, okay, that gives good results. Uh, but can we find a complexity measure, a simplicity measure that, for instance, works across different linguistic domains and maybe not even linguistic domains, maybe we could go also beyond language. So I think that if we could do that, then that would be very interesting because that would be trying to, to walk towards that question, the general question, what is this sort of symbolic structure that makes us efficient reasoners, efficient agents and efficient learners. So I think that would be the direction I would like to go to. And of course, like, I mean, that's a, I mean, like that's a big project, but I would like to do it in some more specific setups, for instance, trying to understand uh, whether you can look at different linguistic domains uh, and look at this trade-off between complexity and informativeness, but then instead of having like a different measure of complexity for each of those domains, this is how the field is running right now, can we find like one measure of simplicity for all those domains mm -hmm. and still recover the trade-off, right? If we could do that, that would be an argument, okay, that might be an interesting measure uh, that is actually capturing something about uh, how the brains are structured and how the thoughts are structured. And what are the different ways they're measured now? Because you would think that maybe you could just look at, you know, what's what's the memory requirement on, on your computer or something like that. So this is done, uh, I mean, I mean, there are a few ways of doing that, right? So one thing is in terms of this uh, language of thought or a minimal description length. So basically you may come up with some very simple, let's say logical system, and then which will postulate certain atomic concepts and certain atomic operations. And then you like a measure how much of those I mean, how long are formulas that capture your concepts? Uh -huh. Right. So basically like a very famous paper doing that. There's this paper uh, by Feldman looking into Boolean categorization. So basically there are like lots of experiments from the sixties where people try to learn Boolean categories. And what Feldman did, he described those Boolean categories using propositional logic. So logic, which only has P's, Q's, like propositional letters standing for properties. And then like simple operators, like I think conjunction, disjunction, negation. And then for different categories, he found like the shortest Boolean formula describing that category. And then he realized that the length of those shortest formulas correlate quite well with the behavior of subject. Like the shorter the formula, the easier it is to learn mm -hmm. uh, those new categories. And that's of course begs a question like, is it really this propositional logic? Why negation, conjunction, disjunction? I mean, there are so many other Boolean operators and they will change the minimal description length. Or maybe you want to use like a completely different logical formalism to do it, right? Because that's basically, it's like saying, okay, human thinks in terms of conjunction, disjunction, negation. Mm -hmm. What else is there? Those seem like, it seems like everything else is built on those. Oh, yeah, but I mean, but you may add more. You may, for instance, add uh, exclusive all, right? So you may have like a normal disjunction or XOR. You may have implication. You may have biconditional. Um, I mean, these are all good. I mean, theoretically speaking, we may all have those as basic concepts. Um, you may also think that humans are actually not thinking using this sort of propositional language, but maybe they even have some higher concepts like these concepts of existential quantification or universal quantification. What do those mean? Are they like that, that you can think something like there exists an element satisfying certain property or for every element, it satisfies certain properties so that you can really use this sort of more powerful logical languages to express your thoughts. Uh -huh. Um, you know, that's a good, a, a good tie into a point of like how normal people view philosophers because normal people don't, don't think about like, you know, does, 
does something like color really exist or like or, or anything that that seems sort of like a silly question to to your average person but then when you when you try and analyze it really deeply it actually becomes hard to to sort of formalize what you mean by that so most people seems like aren't operating on like a system of formal logic so much as like common sense oh yeah i mean i agree right but uh then I think the question is, the question for cognitive science is more to understand not what those people are conscious about, but how they are actually thinking, mm -hmm. right? So it's still like, if you look how people think about colors and you know that that is very strong, like mathematical properties of, of the categories that people actually recognize, they may not realize that. I mean, no one is saying that people in their like conscious thought are like constructing this from some sort of logical formal language. Mm -hmm. But I think like being able to reconstruct it in a formal language can actually tell you something about uh, how people do it unconsciously. Yeah. So I think that's sort of, I mean, that's the goal, right? Uh, yeah. uh, so I imagine that if we were fully able to understand how our, how our, thought and language process worked there's there's two implications there one is you know just just for our Sorry. understanding but the other might be um and turning it into in, into artificial intelligence so which which of those motivates you more is it is it just understanding ourselves better or is it is it taking what you learn and then using it to build more powerful um uh, algorithms no, so personally, I'm much more uh, like attracted to this foundational question of trying to understand, mostly explain why the world is the way it is, why languages are the way they are, why humans behave the way they behave. I think that's this is what I find very much fascinating. I find this, I mean, the second option, like personally, it's uh, not that much on my agenda right now. So I really like think that, I, I mean, I think about myself as someone who is trying to do foundational research in language and cognition and, and logic uh, and not that much applied research. Yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts, Jacob. Thanks, thanks for the questions. It was a pleasure. Pleasure all. All right, thank you. <laughs>